Okay, I'm excited about today, because today we've got this second passage in the Gospel of Mark. Um, this is a rich one, because this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, where he begins to, quote-unquote, do things, right? And one of the things we're going to examine today is, what is Jesus all about? This passage is going to give us an insight into what marks Jesus' ministry, uh, what are the characteristics of Jesus' ministry, and how does that affect our life when we want to think about what our ministries and our character should be like. So this is going to be a rich dive into God's Word. So let's go there. Mark chapter 1. Like always, we're going to read the passage as we get rolling, um, and then uh, from there uh, dive into the outline. So we are looking at the second half of Mark 1. We went through verse 20 last week, and now this week we're in verses 21 to the end. Now, you recall as you're turning there that this is going to feel like a little bit of a different study for those of you who are with me with Hebrews and Romans, because when we do letters, you take smaller chunks, right, because they're very dense. Um, when you do historical narrative, which is what we're doing in a gospel, you can take larger chunks. And so we're going to be taking some larger chunks. And the other reason we're taking larger chunks is because I just want to finish in two years, right? So there's a practical reason. Um, you know, uh, we've got this year, just uh, my goal in this year is just to get through chapter eight, and there's 16 chapters in Mark, right? And then in the year two, Lord willing, uh, pending no more national catastrophes, we'll be back. Um, and finishing the gospel then. Okay, let's pick up in verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue, and he was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us? Jesus of Nazareth, you have, come, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. There he prayed. Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, and I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went out through all, all Galilee, preaching in their synagogue and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hands. And touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But when he went out and began to talk freely about it and spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. All right, lots of wonderful things there. Let me pray and ask God to bless this passage, these passages to us. Lord, we're thankful for this amazing glimpse into the ministry of Jesus. Lord, just to see how he does what he does, to see who he is. Lord, remind us today that we have so many reasons to trust him, and these are more reasons. And Lord, we also have many reasons to be like him. And Lord, may these be the things that mark our ministries too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was thinking this week, as I was preparing the study about fads. I know that sounds strange. If you've grown up in this world, and all of you have at some generation or another, you know there's fads in every generation. If you grew up in the 60s, it was the hula hoop, right? If you grew up in the 80s, it's the Rubik's Cube. 
Um, if you grew up in the sort of into the 90s and beyond, I'm sure you can name other types of things like the hacky sack or what have you. I remember years ago, my kids came home when they were younger with these little fidget spinners that they had for a while. And every kid in school had these things and they spun and I don't know what the purpose was, but that's what fads are, right? They seem rather purposeless. But I'm going to give you a little insight into when I, when I was sort of in college growing up. I grew up sort of in the 80s and was in college in the late 80s and early 90s, and there was a Christian fad in that time period, and it really hasn't gone away. When I was in college, everyone in the 90s had a bracelet, and you know what it said? WWJD. Some of you are like, I got one of those in my drawer at home. <laughs> And some of you are like, now you're hiding your, your wrist <laughs> because you're wearing one. Um, what would Jesus do, right? It's an interesting question to ask. Whenever you're in a situation, whenever you're thinking about a dilemma, when you're thinking about how you interact with the world, interact with a person, isn't it fitting and appropriate to say, what would my Lord do in this scenario? What was he like? What, what were his priorities? And that's really what the passage today is going to tell us, right? The, the passage today is going to say, here's what Jesus is all about. Here's what he did. Now, in this one passage today, it's not exhaustive. We're going to discover that throughout the Gospels, we learn all kinds of things that Jesus did. But what I love about this section today is that it's going to give us sort of four major markers of what Jesus was like in his ministry, okay? In fact, I'm going to call these sort of my four Ps today. Yes, I did alliteration. It didn't actually take much work to get there. You ever heard a sermon and they got alliteration? You're like, that, that, that was a little bit of a stretch. Um, I think these four Ps work. Um, and what they do is they tell us what Jesus is like. And here's what I want to do with them today. There's, there's two layers to, to watching Jesus. One, one layer when you watch Jesus is I want you to, in one sense, be amazed by him and find him wonderful and feel like this is a, this is a person that I want to devote my life to, Right? So part of the four things today are going to be yet another reason to trust him. If I have a, if I have a Lord that's like this, then, then I can give my life to him, right? But that's not all. The other thing I want you to do as we look at these four P's today is I want you to think, how can I be like him, right? It's not just a reason to trust Jesus. It's a reason to be like Jesus. So part of this is self-reflection today as we walk through these four P's. Do these four things, are these what I'm about in my life? Um, would, would, if someone who knew me, would they say, yes, this person, this is the co- things that they're, that they're committed to? And I think those are some great questions we can take away today. So look at your outline. Let's look at these four Ps. I want to look at them as a whole, and then we're going to dive into them one by one. You can see them there in your notes. Jesus has several things about him. We're going to look at the preaching of Jesus. We're going to look at the power of Jesus. Preaching was he taught the truth, power as he fights the forces of darkness, The prayer of Jesus, this is an amazing part of the story. You're like, of all the people who probably don't need to pray, isn't Jesus that? But yet, he's the one who does. And then lastly, the patience of Jesus. Wow, just watching the way he interacts with people in these stories, his compassion, his tenderness, the way he uh, cares for those around him is just remarkable to watch. So when you think about your life, and, and I think about my life, I want to know, am I about God's word? Am I about fighting the, the, the effects of the fall in the world? Am I about prayer? Am I about having a character that's compassionate and patient with others? Those are great questions to ask. They should mark anybody's life and ministry, and they mark Jesus' as ministry. But as I said, the most important thing here is I want you to be enamored with the person of Christ. So when you leave, ah, look at how amazing he is and how much more I want to give my life to him and trust him. Okay, let's dive into the first thing there, the preaching of Jesus. Here we get introduced to Jesus' public ministry, right? Prior to this, you remember from last week, we got what you might call the backstory of Jesus, right? So we know he comes on the scene, there's Old Testament prophecies, he's baptized, he goes in the wilderness and he has the temptation, and he calls his first disciples. This is sort of get everything ready. But then in this section, now that everything's ready, what does he do? He goes out and he begins his public ministry. And what's the very first thing we learn in his public ministry? And this is not just random. I don't think this is all just incidental. I don't think this is just the luck of the draw. The very first thing we find about Jesus's public ministry is he teaches. Look at verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, which is near the Sea of Galilee, because that's where he is. Remember, after he called his disciples, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. I want you to realize that Jesus's teaching, preaching ministry was fundamental to his mission. 
okay? This is the thing he committed himself to as the number one thing. Now, of course, there's other things in this passage, and we'll get to them when we get to them, but it's fitting that Mark starts here. Now, he doesn't just mention preaching, teaching in this section. You recall he also mentions it later, right? Um, In verse 38, Jesus says, look, I've got a mission. I'm going to go to the next town so I can preach there also. Look what he says, for that is why I came. And then we know he did it in other places too. He's going around proclaiming, teaching God's word. This is the essential mission of Jesus. Now, I want to pause on this because it's so central. And I want us to just process this for a few moments together. When people think about Jesus, they think about probably his miracles. We'll get there. They may think about the way he casts out demons. We'll get there. And they may think about other things in his life. But I want you to realize that there's something about the declaration of the word of God that's so central to what he is about. And I want to process why. So I'm throwing this back to you as we get cranked up today. Why do you think, and you can see I put it in your notes there, the question, why do you think the proclamation of God's word is sort of number one on Jesus' list? And as I'll say in a moment, it should be number one on our list. What is it about Jesus' mission you think he's got to go out and the primary thing is that I'm going to teach and preach? Okay, how's it proof of who he is? Yes. So what you've got with Jesus is, if you can think back to the Isaiah passage, right, that we quoted last week in the Gospel of Mark, if you look at a larger context there, it says that the Messiah is going to come and proclaim good news. Okay, one of the things that the preaching does is marks him as the Messiah, right? It says he's the one who God has sent as his anointed one to proclaim good news. Why else do you think the Word of God declaration is so important? It's the most important thing. Why? Why? Yes. Healings and all of that were, were things that he did, but preaching and knowing the Word of God is more important even than that. Yeah, so there's a, there's a recognition in the Christian life and in the Bible that it's not, the Christian life isn't just about doing things, right? The Christian life is about having a relationship with God, and that relationship with God begins by hearing from him, right? By him talking to you. By the way, that's why you're in this Bible study, right? Ultimately, you're not in this Bible study to hear from me. I, my goal here isn't that you just hear what I think. I want you to get into the Word of God and hear what God has to say, right? That's why we're doing this. And this is the essence of the Christian life. The Christian life is having a relationship with God and hearing what He has to say. And what God has to say is lots of things, but primarily, and this is Jesus' message, is the announcement of the gospel, right? Why does He go from town to town to preach? What is He announcing there? The good news. What is the good news? Is God is forgiving sins. Okay, remember we talked about this last week. What's the core message of the gospel, Mark? Why is Jesus starting the second exodus? The amazing thing is he's not going to just deliver Israel physically. He's going to deliver Israel spiritually. He's going to offer a a repairing of the relationship with God for the forgiveness of sins. So what you realize then is that the Christian life ultimately begins with hearing from God, have a relationship with God, and receiving the gospel. I want you to notice the way Jesus does this. Look at the nature of his teaching. Several things stand out here when you think about his teaching. First of all, I want you to notice he does it in the synagogue. In the synagogue, you could think of this as sort of the ancient way the Jewish world did church, okay, just for lack of a better way of saying it. Not everybody lived near Jerusalem where you'd go to the temple, right? And there are little regions, remember this is Galilee, you would go to sort of your local branch, if you can say it that way, which is the synagogue. And what did you do in the synagogue on the Sabbath? Well, you heard the word of God. If you remember the story of Jesus in the synagogue, he would often unroll the scriptures and read from them and teach from them. That's what he's doing here. So what does it tell us about Jesus' teaching ministry? Is he's teaching from scripture, right? He's teaching God's word. The other thing you'll notice here, of course, that really stands out in the passage is the way he taught. Look at verse 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Now, make no mistake about it, the, 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 the people in Jesus' day had heard a lot of teaching. That's what they got every week in the synagogue. And, they, and the scribes and Pharisees were pretty proud of themselves for all the teaching they brought. But something was different here about Jesus. What was different about him? Scholars have, have, have molded this over. We don't know exactly what it is that made Jesus stand out so much. One possibility is that when in the ancient world, when scribes and Pharisees would teach, they would often teach on the basis of the authority of prior teachers. So that, in other words, they would just cite prior rabbis and prior scribes. So Rabbi this says something, and Rabbi Y says something, and that's how they taught. And so they were always dependent on human authority. 
But when Jesus teaches, he doesn't depend on human authority. He just depends on his own authority. You ever notice that when Jesus talks? He doesn't talk based on someone else's authority. He just speaks it on his own authority, right? He, I say to you, right? But by the way, no one talks like that. And by the way, if I were to talk like that, you should find a new Bible study, right? <laughs> if, if I'm telling you, well, on my authority, you should go live like this. On my authority, I say to you, you're like, man, Mike thinks he's all that, right? And you'd be like, that make make you a little nervous, and it should. But Jesus is talking this way. And you might think, who has the right to tell me how to live? Who has the right to tell me what to think? And there's only one person in the universe that does, God himself. And of course, this is the thing I think is happening here. These people are confronted with God's own authority through the person of Jesus as they're teaching. And they're hearing from God, and they're like, Wow, there's something different here. And Jesus backs it up, as we'll see in a moment. Like, are you really God? Yeah, let me cast out some demons, and I'll prove it, right? So he backs up his authority. Here's the thing I want you to realize. With Jesus' ministry, we have an example for us of the power of God's word to change lives. Okay, Have you, Has it ever dawned on you that when Jesus gives the Great Commission, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew in particular, that he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go make disciples of all nations, and I want you to teach them (laughs) everything that I've commanded. And so what does the book of Acts then show? Well, Jesus sends out a bunch of little disciples to go out and preach and teach. Now imagine a skeptic looking at at that and saying, this is your big plan, God? You think you're going to go out and change the world, and the way you're going to do it is through preaching? Some guy stands up and talks for 40 minutes or whatever it is, and that's your big plan. That's how you're going to change the world. There's no big programs here. There's no sort of any sort of uh, uh, other types of sort of flashy systems. You're just going to go out and teach the Bible. And yeah, pretty much, that's the plan. And here's what's amazing is that that's exactly what's changed the world. Is it dawned on you that the preaching and teaching of God's word is exactly the thing that's changed the world and can change your life and change the people around you? Why? Because the only way you change a person is through a divine power. And that's what God's Word provides, right? A divine power to reach the hardest substance on the planet, which is the human heart. And that is the hardest substance on the planet. How do you break into a human heart? Well, you need a divine power to do it. You, by the way, you know this. If you have someone in your life you tried to give quote-unquote advice to, and you're like, let me give you my advice. And sometimes they take it, sometimes they don't. But advice is advice. What you realize that people need to change is they need something bigger than that, right? They need the power of God's Word. And that's exactly the example Jesus sets for you and for me. So look at this final question here. Are you committed to pursuing the truth of God's word in your life? Now, the fact that you're here is a good sign, right? That's the problem with these sorts of exhortations. The people who are hearing them are probably not the people who need to hear them, right? No, maybe the people who aren't here or aren't at church at all. But, but go outside this Bible study for a moment. Are you pursuing it in your personal life? Are you in a church that teaches the Word of God, and when you're helping other people, are you using the Word of God as the basis for everything you do? Jesus lays out this, in one sense, example for us right out of the gate about what his ministry is all about, which is what our ministry needs to be all about. When, when people look at your life, and I think people look at my life, I hope one of the things they say is that whatever that person did in their life, they were committed to God's Word as the ultimate standard for everything they did, and that is the thing that guided their life. And that's certainly something that we all want to be committed to as a result of this first point. Okay, that's the first P. Let's look at the second P. In case you doubt Jesus' authority, and maybe someone in that synagogue did, Jesus says, well, you won't doubt for long, or at least you shouldn't doubt for long, because he's going to exhibit his power here uh, to be able to back up his preaching. So his preaching and power go together. And what does he do with his power? Well, he fights, as I've said there, out the forces of darkness. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is when Jesus is doing his deeds in the world, he's fighting what we might call the effects of the fall. Okay? The fall is a phrase we use to refer to the original rebellion of Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And you remember that story in Genesis. After Adam and Eve rebelled, the world was fallen. In other words, it was cursed with sin and death and disease and destruction and everything happened in there. And what Jesus is doing in his coming here is he's pushing back against the effects of the fall. And in this passage, there's two main ones. Demons and demonic activity on the one hand, and disease and sickness and illness on the other. Now, 
In our little world, we can really relate to one of these. Everybody in this room has been sick. Everybody in this room has fought off disease and suffering. Some of you know people who've been sick. Some of you know people who've been sick and die. We know that's part of a broken, fallen world. But demons too, right? And so I want to talk about both these because this first one tends to be one we don't really give much time to. We think it's a relic of the past, but apparently uh, we have every reason to think that demonic activity is still very real and part of our world today. So let's just look at each of these ways that Jesus flexes his sort of uh, divine muscles, so to speak. So first, over power over demons. Here's where we turn our attention to this story. As soon as Jesus starts speaking, he's interrupted. By the way, don't think this is an accident. Jesus is teaching the word of God, and what does a demon want to do? Stop it, right? So you have an attempt to derail what Jesus is doing. Look what it says in verse 23. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. What's interesting is that apparently this unclean spirit may have been there for a while. In other words, he may have already been in this man for who knows how long, and the prior teachings never sort of brought it out. (laughs) In other words, who knows what they were learning on an average day in the synagogue? Probably nothing that remarkable or nothing that problematic for a demon. They're quite content letting it go. But then Jesus shows up and teaches the truth, and what, what do you have? Resistance. What you realize is that when you speak the truth, resistance is inevitable, and here you have spiritual resistance. Usually we get resistance from other humans, but now we get demonic resistance. Now, demons, as you know, are just fallen angels, okay? In the original rebellion, when Satan rebelled against God, he took with him a a legion of other angels that, of course, joined him, and these are what we refer to as demons. And yes, demons can cause all kinds of problems in the world, and they can, in one sense, possess people. They can wreak havoc in people. They can torment people. And this is one of those things that we typically forget. One of the things I want you to to think about here is the way our modern world dismisses this. Now, I imagine most of us in here on paper would would say, do you think demons exist? Yes. Let me check the little box, and my theology is all nice and tidy. But do you think demons really exist? Really? Like, do you really think that they actually do anything? And this is the question we need to come to -to face-to-face with. Now, demonic activity does not have the same level of intensity at every stage in history, right? Why would it have a lot of intensity here? Because it's Jesus' first coming at the incarnation. Of course, there's going to be a lot more demonic activity. If you, if you read the Gospels and think, wow, there's demons everywhere, yeah, well, wouldn't they be fighting against Jesus? So you, you, this is a battle, okay? So if you think, well, I don't see that as much in my day, remember, demonic activity isn't always at the same level of intensity, but also times, sometimes de- demons work in ways you don't know they're there. This is where uh, I want to direct your attention to a book that I found really helpful over the years, and I know you've heard of it and no doubt probably even read it, some of you, which is C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. Now, this little book is just my copy. Um, I'm sure that you can get a copy anywhere, and many of you probably have this. Now, what's interesting about Lewis's book here is it's, it's, an, it's a fictional book, but he basically has a fictional account where you have a senior demon named Screwtape write letters to his junior de- demon, Wormwood, and he's given him advice about how to tempt humans and how to cause problems. And Lewis recognizes that demonic activity still happens now, right? Maybe not as flashy, maybe not as obvious, but still takes place even now. Um, and one of the things he brings up in the book, and of course this is the words of a demon talking in the fictional sense, is that demons get their best work done when you don't know they're there. And here's one of the things he says. Uh, this is the demon uh, a screw tape writing to his uh, junior demon, Wormwood. He says this, I do not think you'll have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. And by patient, he means you, right, Christian. And he says this, The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, it's an old textbook method of confusing them, he therefore cannot believe in you. This is a classic way of we forget that demons are real. What does we see here in this story? They are real, and they're trying to cause problems and interrupt what, in fact, uh, Jesus is up to. Now, how do we fix that? I, I think there's sort of two extremes out there when it comes to demons. One extreme is sort of just ignore them, pretend they don't exist, which is probably our normal extreme. Then you'll meet other people who are sort of overly obsessed with them, right, where everything's sort of spiritual warfare and casting out demons and some sort of modern exorcism rituals. Well, 
I think both of those extremes probably need to be guarded against. What I want to us to remember here is that Jesus' story reminds us that these powers of darkness are real, and they are affecting your life too. And they are active in the world to try to deceive and destroy God's people. One, one thing you may not have realized here about this is that Jesus would have known these demons because he is the Lord, and he made them. Have you ever thought about that, that, that these were once angels that Jesus would know, and he would know them, and they would know him? So there wasn't like, well, who are you kind of thing. There's an immediate recognition. Did you catch that in the text? Look what verse 24 says. The demons don't say, now, your name is what again? No, they're like, we know exactly who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Here's here's an amazing thing, and we're going to see this later in the Gospel of Mark. People are profoundly afraid of demons and profoundly afraid of people who are demon-possessed. We'll see this particularly in Mark chapter 4 and 5. Yet now you're meeting someone who the demons are afraid of. And that's an interesting reversal, is it not? So if you're afraid of demonic forces, and there's a, there's a right place where you would be, you're like, these, these are scary things. But yet you have someone on your side that they're afraid of. They're afraid of Jesus, terrified of him. They're begging him for mercy. Don't destroy us. In other words, even demons believe in God. Not, of course, salvifically, not in a sense of being saved, but they, they believe, there's no atheist demons, okay? There's no demons that say, this God guy, he doesn't exist. No. The ironic thing is, is that demons are 100% convinced that God is real and are absolutely terrified of him. And this is one of the things that is heartening in a story like this, is that they have no power over Christ, and Christ, of course, casts out this demon, says, be silent and come out of him, and he shows his dominion over him. Now, have you noticed that Jesus wants to keep these demons quiet? Now, this is interesting. On one level, you're like, well, just let them speak. They're telling people who he is. Why why do you think Jesus wants the demons to be quiet about his identity? And even the leper he heals later, he says, you know, for now, don't go around and cause a ruckus about this. Why, Why do you think Jesus is concerned about this, keep things a little secret? I hear a voice. Raise your hand so I can see where... Yes. Yes. Okay. So he knows that the timing of his mission is key, and if things get moving down the tracks too quickly, someone's going to probably try to crown him the Messianic king, thinking that he's going to go fight the Romans and lead a war. And Jesus is like, actually, I didn't come to be that kind of Messiah. I came to die. And he needs to time it out, so to speak, as best he can. So he's trying not to let the momentum run away too quickly, And by the way, it does, right? Remember later in the story, it runs away so quickly that Jesus has to stay out in desolate places. So he's concerned about these demons talking for him. Now, it's not just demons he has power over. Look at the second thing he has power over diseases. This we see throughout the passage. We have the Simon's mother-in-law with a fever. By the way, we don't know what the fever is, but in the ancient world, if you had a fever, that, that could get bad. You can't go down and get penicillin or antibiotics, you know, you could die. So we don't know what kind of fever that was. It may, you know, was it just a cold or was she having an infection? We don't know. Jesus heals her. It says later, the whole city was gathered to him and they brought the sick, verse 34, with various diseases. And then, of course, the main story later about Jesus healing diseases is the story of the leper. Here's one of the things I want you to realize about the story and why Jesus battles diseases. Diseases are the result of the fall. In other words, to put it bluntly, diseases are the result of sin. Maybe not your sin, particularly, but the result of sin in general. Do you realize every time you get sick, every time someone else gets sick, every time there's a disease out there, that effectively this is the world as it wasn't intended to be, and that this is a fallen, broken world, and that sin is the cause of all these problems? How are you going to defeat disease unless you can also defeat sin? In other words... Why Jesus is doing these miracles is he's doing it not just for compassion, although he is. He's doing it to make a theological demonstration here that a new kingdom is coming and a kingdom that fights sin and fights the effects of sin in the world. Now, in your life when you get ill, it can be problematic, right? It can be inconvenient and it can be even debilitating. In the ancient world, if you got sick, can you imagine how debilitating that would be? If you got sick and couldn't work, you would starve. There was no social services to pick up the slack for you, right? You didn't go down to the local food food shelter and say, hey, I lost my job. 
There's no local food shelter. Um, in the ancient world, if you were a leper, it was particularly debilitating to be sick, not only because your skin literally is falling off your body, but lepers could never associate with anyone other than other lepers. So it's not just that your physical body is ruined, your social life is ruined. And every time someone comes near you, you have to yell out, unclean, unclean. No one can touch you. No one can draw near to you. And then above and beyond that, your spiritual life is ruined because guess where lepers could not go? They could not go worship in the temple. Lepers' lives were destroyed on every conceivable level, physically, socially, spiritually. And as we'll see later, what does Jesus come and do with the leper? He touches him. Did you catch that? He says, be clean. I'm here to roll back the effects of the fall. So here's what I want to do. I want to reform, and I said this in our very opening lesson two two weeks ago, but I want to reform your idea of why Jesus does miracles. He doesn't just do miracles. Flip your notes over. You can see the, the, the question here. Why does Jesus heal these diseases? Lots of reasons. To demonstrate he's Lord and God. Okay, fair enough. To relieve suffering. Fair enough. But don't think that when Jesus heals diseases, he's just going and doing his good deed for the day, as if I just want to help people's lives be better. No, it's a bigger message. What's the bigger message? The bigger message is someone here has come who's going to roll back the curse of sin um, and, um, and, and deal with the bigger problem in the world. In other words, it's an announcement of a new kingdom having arrived. Now, I want you to think about the, the famous hymn, Joy to the World, for a moment. We sing it at Christmas every year, right? Joy to the World. And uh, it won't be long until we're singing it again. But one of the famous verses in there, verse 3, I'm just gonna, you know it well, but I'm going to read it to you. Verse 3 of Joy to the World. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Notice that's an allusion to the fall, right, in the garden. And then notice what it says next. He comes to make his blessings flow, and this is the line I love, as far as the curse is found, right? As far as the curse is found. Wherever the curse is in the world, this fallen, broken world of disease and hurting, the gospel's message is to fight back and push back against that. That's what Jesus is about. So here's the question on this point. Is that what we're about? We're primarily about the proclamation of the gospel. That was point one. But we're also, secondly, ought to be about working in our world to deal with the effects of the fall as much as God allows us to do. Now, of course, we're not going to go out and do miracles and heal diseases. That's distinctively something that Jesus could do. But Christians for generations have been known for being exactly the people who are there when people are hurting, or exactly the people who are there when people are suffering. That is maybe one of the ways to be most like Jesus. It's not just announcing the gospel that makes you like Jesus. It's living it out that makes you like Jesus, right? And so when you think about the suffering in your world— in one sense, I want to teach us as Christians to be sort of moth to the flame when it comes to suffering, right? You know how they're drawn to light. When you see suffering, what, what, what should Christians do? We should be drawn to it, not away from it, okay? Now, let's be honest. In our world, we live in a very affluent Western world where we're taught from day one to avoid it, to pretend it isn't there, and to do everything in our life to protect ourselves from suffering. And therefore, when people suffer, we tend to just keep them at arm's length, not because we have some cruel intention necessarily, but because we, just you don't want it in your purview. You want to think of only good things, right? But this is telling us, hey, if you want to be like Jesus, be about those around in your life that are suffering. Now, everybody's in a different situation, right? Depending on your neighborhood, your family, the people you know, and where you can go to reach people who are hurting and suffering. It could be disease-related. It could be loneliness. It could be all kinds of other things. But to be on the lookout for suffering and be drawn to it rather than repulsed by it is going to be one of the ways that we're most like Christ. Okay, let's look at a third P about Jesus, prayer. One of the amazing things we have in this story is in the midst of all the crazy, here's Jesus teaching, he's preaching, he's healing, he's fighting demons, demons. he's in a war. What does he do? He needs to be refreshed in the war. How's he refreshed in the war? Through prayer. You see it here in verse 35. Rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. This is a remarkable thing. Here is Jesus, the Son of God, um, the, 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 the perfect warrior on earth who you think is always strong and never weak, yet he too needs uh, time with his heavenly Father. He too needs, in one sense, his tanks filled up. Remember, he's a real human being. 
Sometimes we don't pray because we confuse ourselves what it's designed to do. Some of us, we, when we think of prayer, we think of mainly, prayer is my big attempt to get God to do what I wish he would do and fix my problems in my life. And, and since I've asked him to fix my problems so many thousands of times in the past and it hasn't really done what I want him to do, I'm just going to stop praying because we think that prayer is mainly us trying to get God to do something. Now, by the way, don't misunderstand. We do bring our requests before God, right? We do ask him for things. We're not saying that's not part of prayer. But what I want to show you here is that prayer for Jesus wasn't just, here's my laundry list of requests. Prayer for Jesus was a time to spend with God in fellowship so that he could be rejuvenated and strengthened to do what? The ministry God called him to. So to say it another way, prayer isn't so much about changing God, but about God changing us. Okay? It's about reshaping us, encouraging us, sitting with God devotionally um, so that God can continue to encourage and bless us. Once you realize that prayer is that, then suddenly prayer has a whole different purpose. It's not so much I'm going to bring all my lists, although you can, again, we're encouraged to bring our requests to God, but to be there with God and let him change you rather than you change God. And why would you need that? Because presumably you need to be charged to do the ministry you're doing. We're going to come to this in a moment, but I mean, imagine how exhausted Jesus is in this ministry. Imagine how tired he is. And so he doesn't say, well, my solution to being tired is sleeping in, right? Which, by the way, I love, just for the record. I'm not a morning person. I read this passage, and I was like, oh, man, I can't believe I got a passage. I'm getting up early to pray. Um, can you not pray at night? You know, what's wrong, with, what's wrong with that? Well, look, you know, Jesus is so physically exhausted here from all his ministry, but, but what does he need? Not necessarily more sleep, although sleep's a good thing. But yet he gets up early because the thing he needs more is time with God to be rejuvenated. Notice how he does it. Not only is it early in the morning, but a quiet place. Here's the thing that'll encourage you. Did you know that when Jesus prays, he prays for you? Aren't you glad Jesus prays? Because Jesus prays for you and me. We see this in the Gospels. One time he tells Peter, I prayed for you. By the way, that would be the greatest thing to hear, would it not? I mean, it's great when a friend, do you ever have a friend tell you that? And they send you a little note, hey, I've been praying for you. That's encouraging. What if Jesus said that? I've been praying for you. Like, oh my gosh, then I bet you God hears you, right? I bet you that that's going to be a prayer that's listened to. So your Lord is so dependent on God, but notice he does it for us on our behalf. What an amazing picture of what our ministries need to be about. And then we come to the last P. This is the one that I think is so stunning in this entire uh, passage, and that is Jesus' patience his patience. And I lump into this also his kindness, his compassion. As someone, as someone who's in full-time ministry, um, I really relate to this passage because I see how Jesus is busy with all his ministries, and he's always, people are always kind of grabbing him. Have you noticed that? So he goes in the synagogue to teach, and then he's got this guy who's demon-possessed, so he heals him. Then he shows up at Jesus' mother-in-law's house. Well, she's sick, so they take the mother-in-law to Jesus. And so she heals him. And then while he's hanging out in the house, he still doesn't have a break because the whole city's bringing people to him, right? All the time. Here, more people at the door. And then he finally goes out to pray in a desolate spot. And guess what? He's interrupted there too. What, what does Peter say? Look, what are you doing? Everyone's looking for you, all right? And then finally, he's walking along and this leper comes and grabs a hold of Jesus. Will you heal me? Do you realize how every time Jesus is, you think how much he's being grabbed and pulled and and, and sought out, and how incredibly exhausting that would be. I'm sure that there's times in your life where you feel this, where you're like, you feel utterly spent, exhausted, people who need a lot from you. It doesn't have to just be ministry needs. It could just be people in your life who need a lot from you. Okay. Now, here's, let's be honest for a moment. When people need a lot from you, and you've been kind of picked out all day, and I need this, I need this, you know, Mom, I need this. What do we tend to do? We tend to be irritable, right? We tend to be defensive, we tend to be like, oh, we sigh, we snap back, I don't got enough, you know, and we, we know that that's the normal human tendency, right? We don't handle that very well. What, what I want you to notice is how amazing Jesus is in the midst of all this. Here he is, perpetually bombarded and utterly spent and exhausted, and every time a new person comes up, what does he do? He doesn't get snappy, he doesn't get irritated, he doesn't get angry, he doesn't say, well, I'm busy, all you hit, get is kindness, patience, and compassion. By the way, did you notice that when the mother-in-law comes to him here in verse 31, look what it says there. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. 
You can just imagine this gentle scene. Jesus doesn't just go, oh, one more person. God, yeah, I've been doing this all day. I come here to your house, give me a break. How about some downtime? One, no, he takes her by the hand, lifts her up, and cares for her, right? Same with the people later, and the leper comes to Jesus. Lepers, he's like, no, not someone else. But no, he's, notice what it says about the leper, he had pity. Really, the better word here is compassion. I don't really like the ESV's translation here. I think com- pity sounds more almost negative. Compassion is the right word. Here's what I want you to realize about Jesus. And this is one of the reasons that we trust him, one of the reasons you can be amazed by him, and one of the reasons you want to be like him, is that Jesus understands your life. Don't for a moment think that Jesus doesn't get your crazy life, your life that's being spent in ministry. Don't think for a moment that Jesus isn't compassionate on your, on your worries, your illnesses, your sickness, your challenges, because Jesus was a real human being. He was the divine son of God, yes, but at the same time, he wasn't just God, he was man, fully man, a real human being. He got hungry, he got tired. Um, He understands your life. And yet, not only is that a reason to trust him, it's also a reason to strive to be like him, okay? Now, am am I going to execute my patience at the same level as Jesus? Well, no. But but isn't it something worth looking to as a guide, as a model, right? That we want to, when people in our life have needs for us, that we look to be as compassionate and kind as we can. Remember how we started this? What, what marks Jesus' ministry and what, what our ministry should like? Wouldn't, wouldn't you want someone to look at your life and ministry and say, you know what that person's about? That person's about the word of God and the proclamation of the gospel. That person is about running towards those who suffer rather than running away. That person is about prayer. And that person is one of the most compassionate kind people I know. If I were to have something on my tombstone written someday about, you know, how tombstones are, the little epithet of what they think you're like and what your life is like, if someone were to say, these are the four things that mark that person's life, I would think that would be maybe the greatest thing one could ever ask for, right? And we never are going to do that perfectly. We're going to fall and trip and make mistakes. But of course, the whole point here is to just look that Jesus is the perfect example of this that we can trust and be amazed by, and then we can strive to be those people be the kind of people who run towards suffering rather than protect ourselves, the kind that pray and show the patience and compassion of Jesus and wrap it all up in God's word. So this is the Jesus you love and serve, and this is a great look at his overall ministry. Now, what's going to be interesting about this is that these, these four things are going to keep happening in the Gospels, right? There's going to be more miracles, more exorcisms, more preaching and teaching, and more specifics as we go. So in one sense, these early chapters of Mark are like an archetype over the whole gospel. And we're particularly going to see some really interesting demonic scenes later in chapter 5 when the demoniac comes running towards Jesus in the region of the Gerasenes, which is a unique story to Mark, at least how he tells it. Um, And so this will be laying a foundation for many future studies uh, going forward. In fact, next week when we get back, we're going to pick up with a lot of these again because we're going to see more miracles um, and more amazing acts by Christ. Okay, lots to talk about in our discussion groups. Let me pray for us, and then we'll transition to that time together. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for a chance to ponder these things. Um, Lord Jesus, you are so amazing that you taught, you fought, you prayed, but all with compassion and patience. Lord, may you make us people like that by your grace. And Lord, may we value those same things in our ministries. And Lord, look to those things as a guide for how we want to live our lives too. We commit all this to Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.